have a duty and a role in this, which is to keep the book not as an obscure museum object. I want it to be a living, breathing object that you still touch, you still have contact with, you can still handle. By keeping the excitement of the book, keeping the story of the book going, I think we can do that. Books probably are the only things other than people that are more than the sum of their parts. Books have an incredibly emotive and, and valuable effect upon us. They carry our souls from, from one generation to the next, from across the centuries, from one culture to another. They transmit the vital and important part of human beings, what we are, how we feel, how we believe, what we think about. They can be transmitted in books in, in, a, in a, a multitude of ways that can't be duplicated in any other medium. The closest would probably be the, the, the feelings and, and thoughts evoked by a piece of music, for example. These are real books, and the word real is kind of important. They're not just about the words that are inside them. Now, one could argue that you don't need aesthetics. I don't need to go to an art gallery to look at paintings. I can get a, uh, I can get a DVD and look at it on my television. I can look at the Rembrandt that, that's in a national gallery on my television. I don't need that connection with a real oil painting. I think many people would disagree that it's looking at the image on the television isn't the same as looking at the actual oil painting in the gallery, and the same applies to the book. There's a whole tactile accompaniment, turning pages, putting the book down, picking it back up again, pausing to think about something, all of which sounds weird and, st weird and silly, really, but they're all parts of, of, of this little sort of dance we do when we're, in, we're absorbing something, when we're appreciating something emotionally. The effect that you can have when you give somebody a book, what their favourite book, so you, you buy a first edition of their favourite book and you give it to them, the effect is an instant transport, transportation to, to where it was when they first read it, how they felt, the emotions it summoned up, the, the, all the attendant senses that, that accompany any important event in our lives. It's not just the absorption of the text, if you see what I mean. It's a beautiful object, bound, illustrated, hand printed, and it's a marriage of the arts. There's one particular type of book that would, that, would, that would be an example, a perfect example of this, which I can just go and grab. The first one is by Charles Dickens in his bicentenary year. Famously self-made writer, um, worked in a boot black, moved on to Pickwick Papers, and at that point they started to publish, or Dickens started to publish his novels in a weekly serial form. Typically, they would come out in 21 parts, bound as 19. That's Bleak House, for example. He would be writing the continuation of the story whilst the first parts were coming out. Um, what would happen if there was an accident? Well, it did happen. His last book was Edwin Drood, and he died halfway through it. So no one knows how it ends. When I handle this, I'm handling what the first readers of Bleak House handled back in 1850. And they were very excited. They didn't have television. They didn't have anything else. So writers in those days were the pop stars of the world. They were phenomena. When he published the series that contains the old curiosity shop, when Little Nell is ill, they know that the next part will tell you about whether she lives or dies. The world was on tenterhooks. And when the magazine parts were put on a boat to be delivered to the United States, the boat was met at the quayside by a swarming mob, a huge number of people screaming up at the boat, does she live, does she live? You can't imagine it now for a book, 
but you've got to think something on a scale of the Beatles arriving at New York or something like that. It was pandemonium, all because of that. This is a volume of the Sussex Kipling, uh, the collected works of Roger Kipling. If you wanted to buy a set of this, it would probably cost you somewhere in the region of 15 or 16,000 pounds for the full set. And I think the quality aspects in this particular case come in the binding, which is beautifully done, uncut rag paper, very strong, very clear, very clean, um, able to take a, an amazing impression of, of text. Um, edges of that are untrimmed, which is a kind of kind of artisan affectation for sort of late 19th century, early 20th century books, almost intended to suggest that they were produced page by page in a kind of in the manner of medieval manuscripts. I think it's a sort of, you know, a little bit of a sales gimmick in some ways. This book would probably, without too much problem, if looked after, last five or six hundred years. Way, way, way beyond the point at which people will have maybe forgotten Kipling. Way, way, way beyond the point at which they will have moved into other forms of technology, recreation or whatever. But quite happily, we have books around here that are easily four or five hundred years old. Um, and if they were properly produced to begin with, then they've survived that. Think of all the plagues, fires, wars, carnage that they've managed to travel past. Samuel Pepys, the famous diarist, famous for recording the Fire of London and the Great Plague that came after it. Now, he wrote his diary in his own particular code. And in the 19th century, a man called Lord Braybrook managed to break the code. And in doing so, he could read all of Samuel Pepys' diary. He'd only published about half of Samuel Pepys' text because Samuel Pepys uh, had a private life, which in those days many people would disapprove of. In late Victorian times, along comes a man called Wheatley who continues the job. He finishes the translation and he publishes about 90% of the text, still leaving out the fruity bits. And it's not until 1971 when the book comes out again, Pete's Diary is published in 11 volumes, and everything is there. Now, just those three editions, you are looking at a history of censorship. So the printed book always acts as this wonderful punctuation mark in history, in a story that says, at this moment in time, this is what is acceptable. We look to the future punctuation point and we can see what became acceptable then and we can put it into our social history and make sense of it. This is The Strand magazine, published by George Nunes. It's the closest you will ever get to being able to, you know, sit in Dickensian London or um, travel through the mountain passes with Stendhal and this kind of thing, or be part of the Napoleonic campaign in Flanders and the peninsula. It's the closest you'll ever come to time travel. I think every single important English writer wrote for the Strand magazine or contributed something to the Strand magazine. Agatha Christie, Churchill, P.G. Woodhouse, Arthur Conan Doyle. Most famously, this is where Sherlock Holmes first appeared. It was the equivalent of television. Even if someone were to transcribe the contents of a Strand magazine into, into e-book form, digitise it, put it onto a, a Kindle, the adverts wouldn't make the cut. They'd, be, they'd disappear. No one would ever know what you know, Brooks soap was or Mellon's food biscuits or where they could go to buy players' navy cut in boxes of 100. These might not sound like very important things, but they are details, and they all collect together to become the equivalent of all those tiny little details you remember about someone that you fall in love with. Um, they're not important details, the fact that they you know, leave a hairbrush over there or their shoes over there or whatever, but they are all things that build up to create a picture of that person that stays with you. This is my copy of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. It's the first deluxe edition. I got J.K. Rowling to sign it for me at St Albans. And I was astounded when I arrived at St Albans. They'd closed the town off to traffic for the signing. Everything was very orderly. The queues were phenomenal and all very well behaved. And I stood there thinking, there's not a politician in the land wouldn't give his right arm to be able to say, 
that's me, I'm responsible for that. But they can't, it was a writer who did it, publishing a book. Famously, she couldn't find a publisher when she wrote it. In the end, it was a small publishing house uh, specializing in women's writers uh, called Bloomsbury, who printed 500 copies, most of which were given to children's school libraries, where they were read to oblivion uh, and the word of mouth spread. I can't see that book being printed now. It'll be issued as an e-book. Firstly, e-books are a very, very sensible idea. They're a very good idea. Um, people read more because of e-books. You can read Mark Twain, James Herbert, Stephen King, J.K. Rowling. They're brilliant for reference, uh, as a utility object for all sorts of things, biographies, collections of letters, facts and figures. Uh, phenomenal uh, for reading on the train. Wonderful. I'll probably be given the opportunity to read lots of people's works that I wouldn't have been given the opportunity to read simply through the existence of a digitised copy. Just one of them floating around out there somewhere. They definitely have a very strong role to play in ensuring that people don't disappear, uh, that, their, that their writings are not lost, like so many people's have been. I mean, half the major writers of the 19th century, we don't even remember who they were. One of the best-selling novels of the 19th century was a thing called The Beetle by a man called Richard Marsh. I can pretty much guarantee that you could walk into any English literature class and ask if anyone's read The Beetle by Richard Marsh, and most people would just go, who, what? But it outsold hundreds of other competitors, it outsold people like Dickens. However, part of every story, part of every piece of information that you read in a book is, is not to do with the information, as it were, any more than a person is to do with their description, if you see what I mean. You can't, you can't describe someone that you find attractive, for example, just say, oh, they're, what are they like? Are they five, four? Uh, dark hair, pretty much it. That, that doesn't work. That's, that's not getting any of them across at all. What's missing? The paper is missing. The texture is missing. The print process is missing. There's another thing as well, which is if you, if you were to walk around this, this bookshop and take various books off the shelves, you occasionally find things in them. You're never going to be able to do that in the future. E-books and Kindles, you're not going to find people's love letters or Polaroids or pictures that they've drawn or flowers pressed between the pages or anything like that. And that is something that the screen no matter how clever the screen becomes, you cannot reproduce that. Technically speaking, e-books, great idea. They're never going to have that effect, though. You wouldn't run back into a burning building to rescue your Kindle, but people have done it for their books. I hasten to say I'm not against the digital book. But there are very different emotional impacts and emotional effects upon us from having an actual tactile book. I think we've been here before. I'm sure that when the scroll was abandoned in favour of the bound book, there were people throwing their hands up in horror. And I'm sure that when Gutenberg brought printing books with movable type to Europe, I'm sure there were many monks in cells who had been spending their whole life writing in longhand, felt that their life had come to an end and their job was over because printing with movable type would destroy everything. But I suspect this revolution is as big as the scroll becoming a bound book. I mean, it's huge. One will have huge consequences for the other, and I th wonder where that goes. It could even turn out to be a really good thing. But that sense of wow community when human beings gather together in excitement with joy in our heart just to get a book, that moment I sadly don't think we're going to see again. And Maybe that's a good thing, but I suspect it isn't.